Welcome to La Taverna Friuli Wines, the definitive podcast on wines from Friuli Venezia Giulia. I'm your host, Wayne Young. Hey, Friuli wine friends, welcome to La Taverna. I'm Wayne Young. Here we are, first English episode of season four. Thanks very much for being here for three whole seasons going into the fourth. Really excited, just past 3,000 listens um, for the podcast on all platforms. Really, really excited about that. Thank you for making that happen. I mean, 3,000 listens isn't Joe Rogan levels, but, you know, I'm happy to have 3,000 people who actually listened to my voice and maybe heard a snippet of my conversation. So really excited about that milestone just passed. Um, today, we got, a, uh, we got a bucket list conversation here with Randall Graham, ex-Bonnie Dune, the Roan Ranger. I made contact with Randall about a year ago. Um, we started you know, sending some messages back and forth on uh, first on social media and then some some emails and he was just completely uh, available to do the podcast and finally we found the right moment for him to come on someone who's uh, known for Julian Wines and 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 been here a number of times to sort of see what's going on here and that conversation was really enlightening and, and very uh, interesting to hear about his different opinions about Friuli wine and what he's doing in California, but I'm not going to hold you up much longer. Um, I really want you to wait until the end of the podcast, because one of the things that I've argued about regarding wine for a long time um, is sort of vindicated by Randall Graham. He agrees with me on one of my more important opinions of, uh, of, of wine. So uh, make sure you make it all the way to the end of this um, almost hour long conversation. So it's not a super long episode today so um but this is our first english episode in a while and it is also the first time that we will have i think you can hear it we're gonna have ourselves a wine rant Has anyone in the world ever become popular or famous by tasting wine on TV? Does anybody really find watching someone else drink and describe wine on television or on YouTube at all interesting or exciting or informative? I mean, I got big problems just with tasting notes in general. I mean, just reading tasting notes in in something like Wine Spectator or Wine Enthusiast or Wine Advocate. I find them a very limited usefulness when it comes to understanding wine. But I mean, even Jancis Robinson couldn't get on television and taste wine and describe it to people who are watching them drink and make them find it appealing. I think we need to stop doing this. I think if you're doing this, I appreciate your professionality. I appreciate your dedication. But man, oh man, nobody wants to watch somebody fucking taste wine. If I was to ask you to describe to me the color red, Would you be able to do that? Would you be able to make me see red with words without using the word red? You might be able to do it poetically, but sort of just describe the wavelength to me or something like that. It's like trying to describe what an emotion is. And I just find 
watching people on television or video themselves tasting wine, I find it not only a bit useless, but I also find it quite boring. We got to find another way. There's got to be a better way. Talk about experiences. Tell stories. Get me emotionally involved. There's nothing emotionally involving about you telling me that you taste blackberries. You find that the acidity is balanced on this wine. What do you think? Do you agree? Do you disagree? I'm looking for opinions. If I'm wrong, if you can convince me otherwise, I am more than happy to listen to your side of the story. But I think history bears me out. I don't think there's ever been a successful show where people are just sitting and drinking wine. Now, I would love to see a show where people are sitting and drinking wine, but not talking about the wine that they're drinking. They're talking about wine in general. They're talking about their lives in wine. That's what I'm trying to do here. But sit and drink and review wine. Got to do better. All right, that's it for the wine rant. I'm done. Let's get into this awesome conversation with Mr. Randall Graham. Welcome to La Taverna Friuli Wines. I am your host, Wayne Young, and boy, oh boy, am I excited today. I am super stoked to have a very, very important person in the world of wine, someone who was sort of part of my early education of wine because I worked at Wine Spectator many, many years ago. Winemaker Randall Graham. Thank you, Randall. Can I call you Randall? But of course. W or would you prefer Mr. Graham? I, I wonder if my dad is in the room of Mr. Graham. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Randall, for spending some time with us today. Um, I'm going to just like jump right into it here because, uh, you know, you're so well known as sort of the, the Roan Ranger and working with Bonnie Dune and La Cigarette Volant and all those sort of things. But I really wanted to start off talking about your more recent projects which are the language of yes, very interesting name there, and and another one called Popeloshum. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Unfortunately, not. Um, it's actually Popeloshum. Popeloshum. Which is a, Popeloshum, which is a, which is a Mutsun Indian name for the settlement around San Juan Batista, but the alternative translation of the word is paradise, which is actually quite accurate. Oh, okay. So literally it is a place that is like paradise. I think so. Popeloshum. Popeloshum, yes. Okay. So can you tell, tell me a little bit about paradise, please? I'm really interested. Well, it's, um, it's a funny place. It's in San Benito County, which is kind of a mysterious county. And it's, it's, it's an area that it's known for its seismic activity where one part of the property, the actually northern boundary, boundary of the property, is in fact the San Andreas Fault. So it's really kind of an intersection of a lot of different influences, political, geological, uh, cultural. Um, it's really kind of a, an epicenter. And it, at some point, we should talk about what, why it reminds me of Friuli. I mean, it, it really isn't Friuli, but there's something psychically, um, spiritually that is reminiscent of Friuli. Well, I, I definitely want to talk about that for sure. Yes. So, anyways, I I, I came to Popolishum or San Juan Batista because I actually dreamt about the place um, and I went on a lot of realtor dates and when I saw it I realized I had actually seen it in a dream so you know I've been sort of on the lifelong quest for terroir and if, if there isn't if there wasn't this this kind of sign um, I, I don't think I, there was anything more so definitive you, I could ask so you literally dreamed of this place and when you saw it you were like yep that's the one that I saw in my dream Yep, that's pretty much how it happened. Uh, and I'm not wow. a woo-woo, woo-agey kind of guy <laughs> particularly, but but that's that's how it happened. Very interesting. It is, okay, wow. So just because I'm, and I'm going to admit this right now, I'm very ignorant as far as Californian geography is concerned. I've been so steeped in Friuli and Italian wine for so many years. Could you just give us an idea of where we're talking about? 
in California? Sure. Yeah, it's in the Central Coast. It's not far from the town of Gilroy, not far from the town of Santa Cruz. It's about 45 minutes southeast of Santa Cruz. Okay. Um, so it's it's coastal, it's mild in climate, um, long growing season. It's really kind of an idea. The only problem, we don't get a lot of rain. We don't get... This year we, we're getting a lot of rain, but in general, that's the only tragic flaw that the area has is not quite enough rain. You've been getting yeah, some pretty horrible weather there recently, no? There's been some sort of bomb cyclone that's come through? Yeah, we had a bomb cyclone yesterday that was pretty exciting. Any uh, damage or was that uh, did that sort of come and go without any major hassle? Well, we were fine. The vineyard was fine. My house in Santa Cruz is fine. There's a town just south of here called Capitola, uh, which got pretty nailed. The wharf got pretty destroyed. Uh, the, the waterfront properties, the um, businesses got pretty nailed. Wow. So it's, it's kind of a funny place. These, these disasters happen about every 10 years or so. Uh, these types of, of sort of tropical hurricane-type storms there? Well, fires or oh, right. or some earthquakes or storms something happens about every 10 years in okay. Santa Cruz it seems oh in Santa Cruz particularly okay so yeah. you you saw this place in a dream you were searching for a winery property for yourself well I was and I was actually slightly misguided or differently guided I guess at the time I was still under the imagining imagination that I was going to produce the great American Pinot Noir. And this was of course a total delusion on my part or a total misstep. Um, I realized that, yeah, that's hard and interesting, but there are more worthwhile things to pursue than trying to make yet another Burgundy in California. A lot of other people have tried to do that. And I thought, you know, I could actually maybe do something more original than try to make a great Pinot. Okay. So I, so I, I am doing some original things um, at Populishum. Some of maybe they're crazy, um, but maybe maybe not. Well, well, it's a little early, too early to tell. Actually, it's not too early to, to tell. So far, so far, so good. Um, we're growing conventional grapes like Grenache Blanc and Grenache Gris, and the results are wonderful. We're growing some exotic varieties like uh, Tiburin and Rouquet, and of course, some Friulani grapes, um, which we're using in our breeding program because we're breeding, we're, we're doing two things that are kind of cookie. One, we're doing self-crosses uh, of Syrah or Serene and Tiburin, and um, this funny grape called Pignolo. Uh huh. So you're Doing crossing so Syrah with Pignolo. No, 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 no. We're crossing the the, the variety with it with itself. Ah, uh, okay. So Syrah, Pignolo is self-crossed, and then we're doing some proper breeding where we're actually taking two lineages, and that's Chiliagiolo and Picolit. Um, we're doing the actual proper breeding. Between those two. Yes, exactly. Wow. That's very interesting. What are you, are you looking well, for a white grape there or a pink skinned grape? Or what are you looking for by crossing Chile Jolo and Picolite? You know, I'm looking for something extraordinary, but I don't have a fixed idea of what it's going to look like. Some of the grapes are going to be red. Some okay. of them are going to be white. Maybe a few of them will be, be pink. Probably not. That's their pink grapes are pretty rare. Um, and then the question is, of course, then what? Do you keep uh -huh. the red grapes separate? Keep the white grapes separate? Do you mix them all together? What do you do? Um, because the project, in a sense, is sort of open. Um, in other words, when, you, when people breed grapes, generally, they're trying to solve a problem. In other words, they like the grape, but they want to fix one thing. They want it to ripen earlier or later or have higher acid, lower acid, or bigger bunch, smaller bunch, looser bunch. They're not trying to, they're not trying to discover something totally brand new in general. Okay. So this is really a journey of exploration. And I honestly have no idea where it's going to lead. 
Wow. So, I, I mean, I'm doing a little bit of research before our conversation. I, I saw something along the lines of 10,000 grape varieties that you're working with there. Uh, oh, no, we don't have 10,000. Actually, we almost have that many. Um, not quite. Every every cross is a new variety. So uh. even the self cross even the self crosses are new varieties. Um, they're, for example, Syrah ish, but not necessarily Syrah. Okay. A self cross of, you know, something interesting. In the case of Syrah, it has a white grape, white parent, and a red parent, um, Mondus Blanche and Dureza. So it turns out, in the white grape is a, uh, is a recessive gene. So 25% of the offspring are white grapes, uh, which is interesting. That is interesting. So I, I, yeah. Um, and the white grapes are actually super cool and, and super, I think, more interesting than the reds in the case of Syrah. Um, we'll see what happens um, with the Chile Agiolo Picolit. Very interesting. I, I, you, so we mentioned Picolite. Are there any other Friulian varieties that you're working with there? Well, I have, you know, we have a little block, kind of a vine library. I've got um, Schiopatino, of course. Um, I Once upon a time, I had Verduzzo. Unfortunately, that's a lot. That's a painful story. I, I love Verduzzo, but um, something bad happened to the Verduzzo. It got bulldozed inadvertently, which was oh, really no. unfortunate. And there is no more Verduzzo in California at the moment, which is really tragic. That is tragic. Um, yes. And of course, as I said, we're, we're working with Pignolo, doing a very ambitious Pignolo project, actually imported the seeds from Friuli. Uh, you the, nursery bean. the Pignolo seeds. Correct. Okay. Right, right from the source. Have you seen uh, Ben Little's book on, on Pignolo? I have indeed. Um, ben actually was the source of the seeds. He, he organized the seeds, uh -huh. which was extraordinary. And his book is extraordinary. Uh, Pignolo is extraordinary. There's something very dreamlike about his book, and there's something very dreamlike about Pignolo. I think it's um, he was definitely the right person to write the book on on. Pignolo. Well, he's he's also an extraordinary guy. Yeah, dreamlike, I think, is a really wonderful way of, of describing uh, Ben's book. Uh, it's really one of my favorite wine books ever, bar none. I, I, en I enjoy going through it, and I enjoy the, the, the graphics of it and the look of it, and um, he's just a really, really wonderful person. He was actually on one of my first people on the podcast when I started uh, about a year and a half ago. Let's stick with Pignolo. What is it sort of about Pignolo as a grape variety that for you is dreamlike? Well, you know, one of the things I think about, among the many things I think about, is um, <laughs> what to grow in my vineyard and why. And um, I'm kind of thinking I've, I've generally come to the conclusion that um, a genetically diverse population will potentially yield a much more interesting wine than a monoclonal or monovarietal um, expression of a, of a grape. So there aren't that many monocipage wines that really work um, in a warmer, drier climate. Generally, for complexity, you need diverse grapes to blend. But Pignolo is sort of one of those grapes that are complete unto itself. In other words, like Pinot Noir, you don't really want to Anything you add to Pinot Noir makes it worse, different at least, and probably more less interesting. And I think Pinola is kind of the same thing. Um, anything else you add to it, I think, dilutes it and makes it less interesting. So it's one of those grapes that is complete unto itself. Schiopatino as well, I think. Um, and I love Schiopatino for slightly different reasons. But, but um, Pinola is mysterious. Um, but it's, it's a grape, you know, one of the things that is also quite interesting to me is the, the grapes that have longevity, in other words, the ability to age exceptionally well. And that seems to be the case both for Schiopatino and for Pignolo. They, they are incredibly long-lived wines. 
uh, I found. But I think it's maybe for, for different reasons. I mean, Schiopettino is not known for its, uh, you know, broad-shouldered structure. It's not known for its tannins. Um, nonetheless, it does age extremely well um, over time. Yeah. Is it what do you do you think that there's any particular reason for that for Scupatino? I mean, my understanding is tannins are probably one of the main components in 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 ageability. So what would you what would you sort of uh, attribute that that longevity to as far as Scupatino is concerned? Well, you know, I don't know for sure, but I think it's received wisdom that tannins and anthocyanins are the structure that enables wine to age but i i have I'm, i have sort of a contrarian hypothesis I, I think there are other components that are equally valuable or, or useful in aging you know pinot noir doesn't have a lot of tannin right and yet it actually ages better than cabernet sauvignon um syrah ages extremely well it's also not super tannic grenache can age in, incredibly well um in the case of Schiapatino, it may well, <clears throat> this is just going out on a limb, but <clears throat> Schiapatino is very rich in a molecule called rotundone. Yes. Which is the same, same molecule that exists in Syrah, the peppery quality. And I, I suspect that may be a component. But I think there's other things going on that are not, not understood. Um, I think it's still a mysterious but there's there's stuff other stuff out there for sure to play a role yeah obviously yes obviously yeah yeah I, you know one of the things that i've spoken about and and you know you uh, full disclosure i i have been collaborating with uh with ronke di chala for a couple of years so and and most everybody who knows me and who know the podcast know that um and the the rotondone thing or is has has come up many many times and it's one of those things that i think suffers from overripeness it, one of those one of those characteristics that when the grapes actually grow in a warmer uh, environment where the grapes get riper, rotundone tends to disappear, at least as far as a, a flavor component is concerned. D do you find that as well in California with Schiopettino? Well, you know, there's actually <clears throat> a researcher in Toulouse whose who's license plate says rotundone. So he and I have had a lot of conversations and he's studied the effects of formation of rotundone. And it seems to me that you need cooler sites, longer season, light, but not too much light. Uh, actually, slightly shaded vines seem to produce more rotundone than, than vines exposed to full sunlight. Um, but it's it, it's late in its formation, so you need a season that's long enough and cool enough um, for rotundone to form. So it does actually happen fairly late. So you want a climate that's not so warm that by leaving it on the vine so long, you're going to have super overripe grapes. Kind of like the mama bear, you know, mama bear, you know, it needs to be just right. Exactly. Well, not too hot, not too cold. This one's just right. Correct. Yeah. So have you worked with some other grape varieties in California as well? I mean, there's a legend that you took some, uh, Rifosco cuttings from, uh, I think it was Mons Clapad from Dorigo. Is that a true story, or am I thinking of someone else? Um, I, I've spent a lot of time with Dorigo, but I don't think I ever got Rafasco from them. I think okay. I got Pignolo. It was Pignolo and Verduzzo, not not Rafasco. It might have, you know, it's been such a long time that it may well have been, but I I, I don't remember taking Rafasco. It's it's yeah, it's it's an. I remember someone told me the story many years ago, more than ten years ago. Um, and as I was trying to remember if, if that was you, I thought perhaps it was, have you worked with Rafosco in California? Um, I have not, there's been, you know, actually at one point I had a few vines of Rafosco, but it's not clear whether it was true Rafosco, um, al pedunculo rosso or not, but there, there, but I don't think it was the real, the real deal. Okay. I forget what, what the, anyhow. Anyhow, uh, and and what about something like Ribola Jala? Have you ever worked with uh, Ribola? Well, I, I 
brought Ribola. I'm not even. I think I got it from George Vare, who's kind of the patron saint of Ribola. Was the patron saint of Ribola, Giala in California. Um, and I, I love what it does. The only problem is I'm trying to grow grapes in San Juan Batista in a relatively dry climate, and Ribola seemed to need a lot of lot more water than we had. Mm-hmm. Um, also, the vines were quite virused. I love it. But I, I sort of decided to let other people take the, the mantle of um, Ribola for, for the moment. I've got plenty of other grapes. Um, I love Ribola, but I, I need to leave something for other people to try as well. Okay. Um, you know, there's, it, it seems very often, and I mentioned Ribola, and, and we've talked about Picolite. These are the, the grape varieties that, in my knowledge, have always been those ones that don't travel well. As soon as you take them out of sort of their homeland, uh, whether it be, you know, uh, Ribola Jala on the, the most, the poorest, oldest, most, you know, uh, rockiest soils on the tops of hills in, in, uh, in Colio in Berda and Colio Orientali, that it does its best. And the same with Picolite. I've heard that once you move it out of Friuli, if you plant Picolite in Sicily, it makes these enormous sort of table grape sized bunches. So I was curious about how those grape varieties developed and how they, they, they acted, how they behaved in a place so different like California. And then we can talk a little bit about how your area is sort of connected to Friuli Venezia Giulia as far as climate or soil or whatever. Sure. Well, actually, it seems my experience, which is not that extensive, is that Ribola actually travels reasonably well. Um, Napa, it's been grown in Napa Valley successfully. Um, the, the few vines we've had in San Juan Batista are, are fantastic, extremely flavorful, modest and bunchy. You know, they don't overcrop. Um, they're just a joy to work with, except they just are very drought, drought sensitive. Okay. And we don't, we don't have the water to grow grow them. Um, and then as far as picolite, um, they, it behaves in San... I can't speak anywhere else because I, I don't think anyone else in California is growing picolite. Um, but it produces, you know, we have the floral abortion issue, so it produces sparse clusters. Um, the, the, we're theoretically working with virus-free vines, so the cluster is large, but it's very, very loose. I mean, there are a lot of shot berries in the, in the cluster, um, it doesn't produce a ginormous cluster. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. Be, you know, um, and I, because I've heard that that floral abortion issue is something that is almost exclusive to Friuli. The moment that you brought it outside of, of the area, that problem kind of resolved itself. So it's interesting to see that it, it, it persists even in, uh, in California. Well, it's, it's the issue, as you know, picolite is genetically distinctive from other um, vinifera grapes, it's a female grape. It's one of the very few vinifera grapes that actually are female. It doesn't produce pollen, its own pollen, so it needs it needs to be pollinated by adjacent vines, typically um, verduzzo, I understand, or something else, or hand-pollinated. Otherwise, you'll have problems of floral abortion. I mean, it's interesting that it's more fertile or more... Uh, fruitful elsewhere but it, my experience at least is it's pretty consistent with freely that's interesting i've i've heard that um i think pinot grigio when it's planted near picolite helps a lot with uh with with this floral abortion problem yeah you need a grape that flowers at precisely the same time so that's the issue it's just that's the time. i mean i understood reduzzo, reduzzo is flowers roughly the same time, but I've never tried that. I never observed that myself. Okay. Um, so tell me a little bit about what you mentioned before about your area sort of sharing some sort of um, soulful connection to, to Free You Leave Venezia, Julie. I'm really curious to hear about that. Yeah, so bear in mind, I've only been to Free Uli a few times, and the last time I was there was many, many years ago. But One of the things that strikes me about Friuli is the independence and the independent mindedness of the people who live there and make wine there and the sort of wildness. 
it seems to be kind of a wild area, whatever that means. And it also seems to be kind of a border area, another or liminal. In other words, it's kind of on the edge of different things, uh, po- obviously politically on the edge, um, geologically, geographically on the edge. But it just seems different. It just seems unlike other any other place in Italy. It doesn't even seem like a part of Italy at, at times. And um, San Juan is kind of the same thing. It's kind of its own unique thing. There's sort of nothing like it. And it's kind of, as I mentioned, it's kind of on the edge of, it borders four different counties. It's on the edge um, geologically, geothermically. Um, you know, as I said, it's right on the, the uh, Earth right on the San Andreas Fault, and it just seems like a, a magical place where kind of almost anything can happen unexpectedly. So, if, for those of us given to magical thinking, it's a it's a perfect place to grow grapes. So, what is your sort of uh, what is your your end goal there? I mean, I, I mentioned I'm, I'm, I noticed something on on the website when you were talking about sort of trying to create a, a uniquely terroir driven wine. Can you tell me a little bit more about that sort of vision? Yeah, in other words, I kind of think of terroir as sort of the complexing element or the soil characteristics as the complexing element in wine. You know, I don't really want to make a, strictly speaking, varietally pure wine because in in a sense that actually defeats the purpose. I want to sort of tamp down the expression of varietal characteristics to allow a greater expression or more articulate expression of soil characteristics. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking that by planting a multiple genetically diverse population, that will be a good strategy for allowing the emergence of soil characteristics. And then in the farming practice, you know, everything we can do to nourish the soil microflora um, and have, you know, sort of the most benign conditions for um, formation of um, symbiotic uh, my, uh, micro microflora all to the good are you uh, biodynamic we have used biodynamic preps in the past at the moment we're not certified but we are and we're not certain nor are we certified organic but we do adhere to organic practice so no fungicides etc okay it reminds me a little bit your your idea there it reminds me a little bit of marcel dice i don't know if you've ever gone to seeing him or if you spent some time in Alsace. The Dice Man, yes. The Dice Man. And he's he's very into that whole idea of um you harvest the site and not the grape variety. Correct. You know, he's an inspiration. Um I mean we don't do as, as radical a root as like root pruning that he does. I mean he does he's he's very radical as far as trying to enhance expression of soil characteristics but we we take we take inspiration from it from his work okay yeah it reminded me very much of him so you said you haven't been here in a long time when was the last time that you were here in friuli probably 25 years ago no yeah it's been a, it's been a long time well you're gonna it's have to come back long. no kidding yes <laughs> Um, it would be great to, to have you and see you here in Friuli. Do you do you remember your first time in Friuli? When was that? That had to have been almost 35 years ago, um, visiting the Dorigos. And um, I met, remember meeting Girolamo, who was, had the habit of dressing in army fatigues and driving a Jeep. And I, I had the sensation that he regarded the wine business as a type of war. Um, to be waged, <laughs> eternal vigilance was necessary. You know, it was a campaign. It was a military campaign. It was pretty. I thought it was pretty funny. Was there? I mean, other than the way he dressed, was there a, something about his demeanor, about his character that you that you got that idea from as well? Again, I think it was the military fatigues and the cigar, kind of vaguely reminiscent of, of Fidel Castro. <laughs> Very. So the whole like iconography was pre- was pretty consistent. And it, was there a specific reason why you came to see Dorigo here in Friuli? 
Well, the, the individual who arranged the visit, uh, Gerald Weisel, was a, was a friend of the Dorigos, so I was trading on his their, his relationship with them, and so he, he made the introduction. We obviously hit it off pretty 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 nicely, and I've, I've run into Alessio since then at wine fairs and other other places, but it's been it's been a while since I've been to, back to Friuli. Do you remember your first Friulian wine? You know, frankly, it had to have been a Dorigo wine, and it was probably, the, strangely enough, their Cabernet. Um, they did, they did a, I don't know if they still do it. Uh, I forget what it's called, but it was a kind of a Bordeaux, a Bordeaux blend. Um, and I, but I, I was remember being most impressed by the Pignolo. Uh, that knocked me out. And then, actually, in subsequent vintages, um, their Verduzzo and their their Picolite has knocked me out completely. So um, it was kind of like Pignolo and this is, you're really a, a big sort of uh, a, a, a big proponent of the, the local grape varieties here and things like that. So Pignolo was sort of your, your, your main drive. So, so when did you get the idea to sort of start bringing these grape varieties back to California? Well, immediately I, d- I didn't have a, very well formed idea of what to do with them in California, but I just thought, you know, I really need to have these kind of in the in the library, and I'll I'll figure out later what to do with them at some point. Okay, and and so I know you've you've also um, you've also talked about Ronca di Chala, and you've talked about Chala Bianco. So was that your first introduction to Schiopettino, or were there other wineries that you spoke about uh, Schiopettino with? I have had other Schiopettinos, but honestly, Ronchi di Chiala is far and away the most interesting expression of Schiopettino that I've run across, and especially the older older vintages, which are extraordinary. Um, as I've mentioned, I'm a Rotundone freak, and I love Syrah when it comes from Cote Roti, and I love the pepperiness of Schiopettino. Um it's a funny looking. It's a funny looking grape. That's for sure. Uh, the cluster is very, very long. Um, and a lot of people think, cut the tails off, don't they? I, I think I, I need to get into the habit of doing that as well. We 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 don't we only have a few vines of Schiapatino, like a dozen, but um, I'm hoping to make maybe plant a few more and, and do a little micro vinification uh, to see what it can do. But the the flavor of the grapes is amazing, but I, I think you're you're right. You want to cut off the bottom third of the of the grape and maybe the wings as well, or at least the bottom third because it's a very cylind- it's a cylindrically shaped cluster, um, so, and it's ginormous. <laughs> it can get very very big. Yeah, um, yeah. I know that there are some producers. I, I know that Ronki Di Chala does not do that, but they definitely do that cutting off the, the, the point of the, the, the bunch and the, the two wings to sort of really get that heart as, as, uh, as ripe as possible. Is that sort of um, intense ripeness really important for a Schiopettino? Frankly, I would be just speaking out of turn, but I'm sure that's the case. I, again, big clusters take more time to, to ripen and you lose acidity. I think you want to kind of bring it in for a safe landing within a certain time frame. So um, thinning, even though it's a manipulation, is probably something that Schiapertino needs most years, I would reckon. Yeah, are you talking about in general or just in California? In general. You know, I can't, I can't speak for freely, for but at least in my, vine- in my vineyard, I think it needs to be thinned. Um, again, Virus-free, virus-free vines are often wonderful, but they often produce way more crop than uh, is optimal. So often virus-free vines need super, super thinning for their optimal expression. Virus-free vines in general, not just Schiopettino, just to be, just to be clear. Correct, exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, this is sort of off the track here, but um, you've mentioned sort of virus-free vines on a number of occasions. Is this something that, I mean, if you're talking about a grape variety like Ribola Gialla or like Schiopettino that tends to be very productive, 
Um, is that something, this is sort of viral element, is this something that's almost kind of necessary in the, the, in keeping the, the vigor down on the grapes or, uh, is, is really what you're looking for in all cases, vines that are virus free? Well, you know, again, they would murder me at UC Davis for, for saying this, but I, I think you're, you're right. I think virus free comes with, at a price and, and again, Sometimes it's counterintuitive, but I think sometimes virus vines will produce more interesting grapes than virus-free vines. Um, there's a price for it, of course, like short, short, shortened life span of the vine. But I, I think that the quest for this mythical virus-free status um, doesn't always redound to uh, better wine quality, alas. Wish life were simpler. <laughs> nothing is, you know, nothing is, is clear cut in the world of wine. I mean, and obviously I do not have the type of depth of knowledge and experience as far as, as uh, you know, winemaking and, and vineyard practices are concerned. But when I do teach my wine classes, the first thing that I always teach the folks who come and, and taste with me is there are no right answers in wine. The, the answer to every question in wine is it depends so yeah, it is yeah. quite complicated. Yep, I agree. Are there some other um, Friulian producers who you're uh, who you really really like? We've mentioned Dorigo, we rent, we've mentioned Chala. Are there any other ones that are sort of uh, on your on your list, big or small? Well, unfortunately, I really like Brisson. Uh, I'm not a big fan of his politics, but um, his wines are, are unfortunately really good. Um, I like Venica quite a bit, uh, Ronca del, del Niemetz quite a bit, um, Via de Romans as well. And then, of course, the, the orange contingent, Gravner, I like, uh, Radicon as well. Okay, so that, that whole um, uh, Oslavia troop up there who I think are, are, are really, really uh, interesting in the sense that they have turned a very tiny area with only more or less seven producers who are doing a very specific type of wine into a global destination for, for wine. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a model for a place like say Prepolto. I think that type of concentration on place and a specific product is uh, really important to the future of, of Friuli and wine. Yep, agreed. Are there any Friulian wines that you haven't tried that you you wanted to try? Uh, I don't think so. I just want to broaden. I want to taste as many Pinolos and more Schiapatinos as I possibly can, just to just to understand the possibility of the grape. So there's a whole world out there. Um, it's very hard. Pinolo is not the easiest wine to find in in Cal or in the in the U.S. Um, not that much seems to be exported, but I'm, I'm trying to broaden my experience with that for sure. Do we, do we make too many different kinds of wines in Friuli in no, your opinion? I don't No, Hardly. Really? Maybe not in your, I don't think so. I mean, this is coming from a eclectic human, human being. Um, I don't think so. I mean, maybe for maybe you don't need to sell every single wine in every market, but I mean, if if the wine is interesting and a useful expression of the of the variety, why not? Um, I mean, I guess that ultimately, at the end of the day, if the winery can't sell all the all the wines it makes, it's probably making too many wines. But um, winemakers also have to stay interested and engaged, and some some winemakers are more engaged by having more variety and others just like life a little bit simpler. So you have to do what works for yourself. Yeah. There seems to be sort of two different arguments in Friuli when we talk about, because, you know, we could do better on the international sort of market and the international scale. I mean, you said it was difficult to try to find Pignolo. I'm sure it's also difficult to find Ribola Gialla and Friulano in California, but there's sort of two schools and there's the one school that says we need to keep and promote and sell and continue to make all of these different varieties 
simply because th they're actually quite good. Um, and yes. then there's another side that says there's too many different types types of wine. Friuli doesn't have sort of a focused image in the international market. Do you think that there's any merit to either one of those arguments? There's merit to both arguments. I find myself more inclined to favor the first argument than the second. But, you know, certainly the, there's less of a need for international varieties. I, I just don't know that, you know, having said that, uh, Freely makes very nice Sauvignon, um, extremely nice Sauvignon. Um, but I, I would stay away from international varieties. I think that's, and actually pretty good Merlot as well. Um, but I think the indigenous grapes are the ones that need to obviously need to be focused on. So I, I guess if some, ultimate. if some of the things to be sort of, you know, if you were going to, if you were the one who was sort of saying, what, what should you leave behind? It would be sort of uh, the Cabernet Sauvignons, the Cabernet Francs, the Chardonnays, things like that. Exactly. that you find all over and concentrate on native grape varieties and some of those international varieties that tend to do really well here. I always say, yes, there are great Merlot in, in, uh, in Collio. Um, there are great Sauvignon Blancs all over Friuli. Um, so yeah, I don't see any reason why we should eliminate those, but we should, I think, pay a little bit more attention to, uh, local grape varieties. And I think that's happening. Good. As so it should be. I believe that that's happening. Yeah, definitely. Um, are there any winemakers in California that have a Friuli in background? Are there any like people from Friuli that make wine in in California? There, there must be, but I don't know you don't who know. they might be. I know, I know. There's people who love Friulani grapes, like Steve Mathiason um, and the late George Ver. But um, honestly, I don't know anyone offhand. Okay. And your, your other winery or your other project, the language of yes, is that somehow connected with Popa Loshum? Kind of not quite at the hip, tangentially connected. I mean, I'm trying to apply some of the lessons I learned at Popa Loshum to the work at language of yes, but the language of yes is, is more, not surprisingly more conservative, um, kind of staying within the bounds of, um, Rhone in southern France. Having said that, Language of Yes is the first winery in California that I know that actually released a uh, Tiburin, and we're planting more Tiburin. Um, somehow I've persuaded the folks at Gallo that Tiburin is the answer. Um, I've persuaded myself that Tiburin is, is the answer for California. For uh, In other words, how do you make an elegant wine in a warm, dry climate? Uh, such as we find in California. So I think Tiburin has great potential. Um, and that's one of the things that's happening with language of yes. It's, it's interesting because when I, when I saw, you know, obviously I follow you on, on, on the social media. And, and when I saw the language of yes, the first person who I thought of was Ben Little. It sounds so much like the name what Ben Little would give to a winery. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think his whole book on Pignolo is is basically uh, of the language of yes. I mean, I think Pignolo is the grape of yes. I mean, there's it, just something, everything he, about the book, about the grape is affirmative. D tell me more about that. That's very interesting. I mean, again, without being too mystical or too new agey about it, there's, there's, um, I have this idea that wines can possess a sort of life force and, you can be sort of as mystical about that idea as you as you want to be, but in fact, what it is is its ability to age and live over a long period of time. And I, Pignolo has that sort of life, liveliness, elan vital, um, life force to it that I think is really, really, really special. And um, those are the kinds of wines that. Again, you can't say this on a on a wine label, but it's the kind of wines that inspire us and um, sort of in, in energize us and enliven us. Again, you can't say that, but um, I think it's true. Certain wines really kind of improve the quality of your life. 
and that's those are the kinds of wines I'm interested in. So you're literally because uh, when I when when you first started saying that, I was thinking more along the lines of, you know, that enliven us so I, from an enological point of view. But you're literally talking about the the consumption of this wine enlivens us. Correct. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yes. The language of yes. I would love to get you and Ben in a room together and just sort of bottle of Pignolo on the table. I'll just shut up and listen to you guys talk because I think that would be an amazing conversation. Well, it will happen one of these days for sure. Um, hopefully after I've got, or at some point when I have some product, some, some Pignolo to show or you know, some of these oddball Pignolo seedlings. And I'm obviously very curious to see how much variability there is in the seedlings, whether any of them taste at all like, like uh, Pignolo or, or not. Um, actually the, the oddball, the odd li- outliers are the ones that are possibly the m- most interesting. Um, so we'll, we'll see that that's a good few years away yet. Yeah, I was going to ask, how long are we going to have to wait for that? Well, the seeds just just came in a few months ago, and they're they're just coming out of the refrigerator um, in the next couple of weeks, and they're going to be germinated at the nursery. So it's going to be a few years yet, alas. Oh, okay. It's, um, I'm, I don't know if I have that kind of patience, Randall. <laughs> well, you don't, you don't have any choice. Exactly. So keep your- keep your pants on as it were. <laughs> uh, well, I will try I will try well uh, yeah let's hope that the the conversation um, continues in the conversation between you and Ben which I hope to be a part of or at least be witness to um, happens before the wines uh, the, before the Pignolo is is ready to go any, any old time ne- next time in Friuli for sure well, I hope you. I hope you come. I hope twenty twenty three is is the year that you you get out here. That would be wonderful, and I would, I would love it if you could, you know, stop in and uh, have another little chat here at uh, at La Taverna. Before we go, and I know you, you have plenty of things to do. You're just starting off your day in California. Um, I believe the one thing that I was really curious about because I remember this when I was still working in New York City many years ago. Was it not you who staged that uh, the funeral for corks um, in New York City? Was it you who put like that? Uh, there was like a, a coffin in Grand Central Station where people would throw corks into. Was that you? Yeah, it, indeed, it was. Yes. The, the funeral for Monsieur Thierry Bouchon. <laughs> um, Do you still yeah. believe that, that, that screw caps are the future? Do you still think that cork is on the way out? Well, you know, it's interesting. I love the aesthetic of cork. I love the tradition of cork. But frankly, screw caps, I think, by far, are, are the superior closure relative to cork. So um, I'm I'm still a true believer in screw caps. Um, I'm hoping that I will accomplish more in life than just being a great popularizer of screw caps. But I, I, I believe in them. I think they're I think they're great. Well, I'm sure you, your legacy will not just be promoting screw caps. I am sure. Let's hope. Let us hope. Yeah, let us hope. Well, that's a great. So you even for something like older, you know, wines like a, a Pignolo, you would uh, prefer to have that age under a screw cap rather than a, than a, a traditional cork. Yeah, it's a misconception that wines don't age under screw cap. They actually live longer under screw cap relative to, to corks. They, their, their maturation is a little different than, than that of a cork closure. It's a slower evolution and tends to be more backward at the beginning. But it will go, I reckon, 50%. The, the wines will live 50% longer in screw cap compared to cork, which is non-trivial. Wow. Okay. That's fantastic. Uh, Because I I remember having conversations about whether or not wine aging in the bottle is an aerobic or an anaerobic process and how how much transpiration of oxygen is there through um, a cork with a wax seal, which is basically how every vintage port is closed. Um, Yet those wines develop for decades and decades. So, you know, is that sort of narrative of you must have oxygen transpiration for a wine to age. Is that just not true? It's not true. Yeah. 
development of bottle bouquet and complexity is a totally anaerobic process. It does not require oxygen. And a, a, a dense cork with a, with wax seal on top of it is pretty much what you get with a screw cap. So the amount of oxygen ingress is, is pretty darn minimal um, and not necessary for the aging process. Well, that is... As as I- that is, is what I've been sort of saying for many years, and I am honored to have you sort of vindicate me um, regarding that, that technical piece of information there. Randall, I am going to let you go. I really, really appreciate the time that you've spent with me here today. My pleasure. And um, I hope to see you in for you as soon as possible. Sounds, sounds great. All right. Thanks again, Randall. My pleasure, man. Take care, Wayne. You too. Cheers. Bye-bye.